For today's colloquium, our speaker is Mina Arvanataki from Perimeter Institute. Mina has made many important contributions to theoretical physics. Uh, a theme in much of her work is very low mass particles uh, that may or may not be the dark matter, particular axion-like uh, particles. And she won the New Horizons Prize in 2017, primarily for that, uh, for that work. But today, she's going to talk about something completely different. But still, very light particles. But these particles are not ones that uh, might or might not exist. Rather, they're the neutrinos of the standard model. And you can see from her first slide that she's collaborating with a fellow Greek, Savas Demopoulos. And you know what they say? <laughs> Beware. Beware of Greek, Greek sparing guests. So uh, <laughs> let's all be skeptical on that for this one And uh, welcome, Nina. Yeah, that's very appropriate, actually. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Mark said it very well. Um, for the second, in fact, time of my career, I'm going to talk about things that. Uh, that actually exists. The first time was 10 years ago when we, with an experimental friend of mine, proposed a high frequency gravitational wave detector. Um, so, Max said about neutrinos. So, and actually, these are neutrinos that many people don't think about. They're not particularly popular, and you'll soon understand actually why. Um, but in order to explain what they are, we need to go back in time. And, uh, and I would like to start with a standard picture of what we know the cosmology to be. So we believe uh, what we know, what fits our data very well, is we think that the universe started with a huge explosion, what we call the Big Bang, was followed by an exponential growth that made, made the universe very uniform and as tropic. Um, after that, that, after that period ended, the universe got hot again. And since then, it's been cooling down. And how hot it got, we don't really know. We know it must have gotten hot at least at temperatures of a few MeV. Uh, and this is roughly around the time where nuclei started forming. Uh, this is what we know as Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, then, the universe pulled even further. At some point, it became energetically favorable for nuclei, in particular, mostly protons, to combine with electrons and form atoms. So now light could propagate freely in the universe. Um, as things got colder and colder, eventually dark matter came to dominate the evolution uh, of the universe. And we have galaxies. And now, fast forward today, we are roughly 13 billion years young. Um, uh, and uh, this is where we do our observations from. Perhaps the most um, known part of this cosmological picture is the cosmic microwave background. It was generated when the universe was 400,000 years old. And it was the time where atoms formed. So it was the time where the universe became trans the universe became transparent for light. This is what is known as the surface of glass scattering. Um, at the time, the universe was about the temperature of a fraction of an EV. And uh, this is a picture from Planck of the cosmic microwave background and the fluctuations in the temperature, hot spots, cold spots. Um, this is a very well-known picture now. This picture has allowed us to turn cosmological observations, the picture from the surface of glass scattering, to precision measurements. Thanks to, to a large degree to, to this, to the, cosmic, to the measurement of the cosmic microwave background, combined with other astrophysical observations, we've managed to measure the constitution, how, how the universe, what makes up the universe, percent precision. So it makes, now cosmology is a precision science in many ways, thanks to this. So the, the cosmic neutrino, so this is the CMD, 
the cosmic neutrino background is an analyzer of, of the cosmic microwave background or the CMP as it's more compactly called. And it was generated that when the universe was a fraction of a second old. Okay. So first of all, what are neutrinos? For those of you that don't know, neutrinos are uh, elementary particles. They are partners of the electron. Like the, the electrons that come in three flavors. There is the, the, the electron neutrino, the tau neutrino, the mu neutrino. And they, are, um, they, on, they don't have a charge. So they don't interact with light. They only interact with the weak force, the force that is responsible for radioactivity. They were first theorized back in the 30s when people started studying radioactivity. And in fact, since then, they've been attracted, they've been the center of research. Uh, because the weak force, as the name suggests, is a weak force, these particles interact very weakly. So they are hard to study. And um, uh, they, it's a very active field of research. Um, and uh, the latest uh, thing is um, uh, fellow Canadian, Art McDonald got the Nobel Prize uh, for his work studying how uh, neutrinos, um, the properties of neutrinos, how neutrinos, neutrinos oscillations uh, in the laboratory setting. So neutrinos, since radioactivity is part of the universe, okay, the weak fast part of the universe, there are many sources of neutrinos. Okay. And this is a plot that shows the sources roughly as a function of of energy, so more energetic neutrinos are here, and higher flux or higher density, if you like. So most of the things that people know, the things that are emitted from the, the, the hydrogen burning the, uh, uh, inside the sun, um, things that are generated in supernova in uh, reactors are actually very high energy. Uh, the things that come from the early time of the universe the cosmic neutrino background are in fact extremely low energy and they are the most abundant neutrino species that we have. In fact, there is the only, so these guys, because they, they, they are created in radioactive processes and these particles are extremely light, they are usually created very boosted. So the, the neutrinos that come from the big bang, due to the expansion of the universe, these things have pulled down so much that they only move the speed of a fraction of the speed of light. So they are non-relativistic. And they're the only non-relativistic species that will ever create. Now they were created similarly to the time, uh, similarly to the, to the photons from the CMB, they were created at a time where the universe, the, the, weak, the weak interactions became so rare that the universe became transparent with these guys. And because the weak force is much weaker than the electromagnetism, this happens much earlier. So it turns out to run the numbers, this is happens when the universe was a fraction of a second old. Um, because they froze out when they are relativistic, they follow a Fermi Dirac distribution. They have a temperature of, a, of roughly two Kelvin. Um, and in terms of density, so you have roughly a hundred neutrinos in the tip of your finger at any given time of one species, electron, neuron, or tau. Um, in the standard model, there is the expectation, similar to what have electrons and positrons, there is the expectation that you have roughly equal numbers of neutrinos and antineutrinos. And this asymmetry is really small, it's roughly 10 to the minus nine, because this is what we know from measuring the barium sector of the standard model. Okay? Now, this only applies for particle physics when neutrinos are Dirac. If you want to know about Majorana neutrinos, then you have to ask me in the end. So if you remember to ask me in the end, I'll tell you about them then. Um, so why is it important? Well, it's obvious why it's important because if we were to detect it in a laboratory setting, we'll get a snapshot of the universe, which is just a baby, okay? The other thing is that the neutrino sector exactly because it's so, um, uh, it's so weakly interacting with us, we actually have a lot, of, we don't have precision measurements of these properties. So uh, it gives us another handle. There's an entire, it's an entire sector of the standard model that we haven't studied very well. Now, 
People know the story of the CMP and how they discover. In fact, there was a New York Times article recently that talked about they wanted to destroy the antenna that detected the cosmic microwave background. And thanks to petition, it wasn't destroyed. And that happened in the 50s and 60s. Okay. So with this, we've known the cosmic microwave background, the major signature of the Big Bang, has been there for a while. But the cosmic neutrino background, we haven't seen it. And the question is why? Okay, and the answer is because if we use the way we are used to detecting elementary particles, basically through scattering, the scattering rate of these guys is extremely small. And the reason it's extremely small is exactly because these guys are extremely slow by particle physics standards. So any scattering cross section you try to design in the lab, you'll find that these things can go through the earth without interacting at all. So there is no reasonable detector that where um, you just can bounce off and give you a large kick, okay? Um, so, um, so it's a lose-lose situation here. G Fermi is very small, their energy is very small, so it makes everything even smaller. Now there are some ideas to go around this. So it turns out you can use radioactive processes to detect the CNUV, basically, where every time you something decays, for example, a beta decay, you create an anti-neutrino, you can reverse the process and say a neutrino was absorbed from the cosmic neutrino background and try to look for processes of absorption of neutrinos in radioactive elements. Okay. And the first paper was written, was written by Weinberg in 62. And it's the idea that where the uh, Ptolemy proposal, if, if people know it, was based. Okay. Um, the other way, so this enhances the, the cross section by quite a bit, uh, but it's still hard to do basically because the background, you have the ordinary standard not to decay. So that is, 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 uh, is extremely, it happens with an extremely large rate. Um, the other thing you can do <coughs> is because these neutrinos are so slow, they have their wavelength is roughly a millimeter. So if you look at the elastic scattering of these neutrinos, they interact, um, they, they can couple coherently with whatever atoms you have within a millimeter. But the problem is the momentum transfer you create during the process, even though the cross-section is large, is really small, so small that it's very hard to detect. So another lose-lose situation. So, so now we find ourselves in a situation where there's something of the standard model, a very well-known part, that essential part of the lambda CDM picture that we haven't seen. So the question is, what can we do? Um, an idea perhaps that we've been contemplating is to go beyond scattering. What other effects can we look for and look for that, um, how can we enhance the interaction? So given that G Fermi squared is very small, we expect G Fermi to be less small, okay? And um, and turns out the effects that are proportional to G Fermi are refractive effects. This is what happens to any wave that goes through matter that it interacts with. It can happen with photons, as we know, we have lenses. It can happen with neutrons. It can happen with electrons. It can happen with everything. So it happens with these guys as well. Okay. So. The reason that this diffraction happens, the refractive effects happen, we can understand the following way. Um, so there is an interaction energy of these cosmic neutrinos as they go through matter because matter has a weak charge. Okay? It's not like electromagnetism where the matter is neutral. Um, and there is an interaction energy that's set by, so if I place an atom, inside the neutrino background, it will feel an interaction energy that's proportional to the weak charge of the atom, Fermi is constant, and the neutrino and the neutrino asymmetry. Now, now, the question is, now if I have an interaction potential, can I have a force on the atom? So what you do is the same thing you do with gravity, you have a conservative potential, you take the derivative with respect to distance, the minus grad u, and you get the force. So can you look for this? And in fact, back in the 70s and 80s, people knew about all these effects, 
and we tried to design experiments to detect it. And what we found is, well, if you're in a uniform cosmological background, there is no gradient, so there is no force. So it's a, it's a, it, there is no way you can detect an effect that's proportional to GFL. So this became what is known as a no-go theorem, and uh, there were papers by Kabibo Mayani and uh, Langacker and collaborators back in 1982. Um, and they said, well, it, basically this, that for the neutrino density is uniform, so there, is, there can be no force. And they stopped all these experimental proposals on their tracks. So people just gave up. There is one effect that remained, and that effect was the interaction of neutrinos with spin. So neutrinos are fermions. And if you place a spin inside the neutrino wind, so you have to move through the uh, neutrinos. So there's a spin moving through the neutrinos, the spin up and spin down, the spin up and spin down energy states will have a small energy splitting. And uh, it turns out this is even more hopeless because you see the size of this. This is um, the Hubble scale in fundamental constants is in fundamental units is 10 to the minus 33 EV. So this is 14 orders of magnitude on the Hubble scale, the rate of expansion of the unit. So this is really small. The best we have done in the lab is roughly 10 to the minus 25 EV. So this is a good 22 orders of magnitude away. Okay. So this is really, really small. So, but it's also remains small because another fact is, even though this is not suppressed by any gradients, the neutrino and the neutrino symmetries tend to the minus now. Okay, the hundred per centimeter cube. So, so it makes an even hopeless, a hopeless situation even more dire. Uh, yeah. Thanks to that. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Formal. Yes. Question. Yes. Exactly. Can we still get the formula for the potential. Yes. So the potential is, is this here. So this is like, this is for the interaction of a single atom in the neutrino wind. So it's the weak charge of the atom, um, which depends on the flavor of the neutrino. For example, if you have muon and tau neutrinos, it's the number of neutrons that you have that determines the charge. Um, and the term is constant and the density of, uh, of neutrinos minus the density of other neutrinos, okay? Uh, so, so, okay, this is where we are at, okay? So, um, back in uh, two years ago now, so it was right after the end of the shutdown, I'm telling this story to everyone. People ask me, why on earth did you decide to work on such a hopeless problem? So, um, it was the end of COVID, okay? The COVID shutdown, things were opening up. So, um, I have tenure. Sounds a senior. <laughs> so we were like, we might as well as well work on the hardest problem we can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there was a list of things, like things that are maybe not the end of like the hierarchy problem, the cosmological constant problem, and the cosmic neutrinos were right at the bottom of the list. <laughs> and, and and what we did is we decided, okay, we have let's go for it and try to see. So what we decided to do is go back to the old papers, go back to the old literature from the 70s and the 80s and try to understand it better. And, and, and we decided to say, okay, forget about detection because this is something that I think every particle, every, every particle physicist at some point has thought about this issue. It's just that you go back and then you're forced to think about detection right away. And then you find small numbers and get discovered. So our strategy was let's just try to understand what signal we can get, and then what we'll decide if it's small or not. It's still going to be small, by the way, <laughs> but let's see how hopeless it actually is. So, um, so by doing that, though, we discover some interesting effects. So the first thing that we found out is that the Earth, the presence of the Earth, and the fact that it, with its with its weak charge changes the local distribution of neutrinos in a way that scales like the square root of G-Fermi. So G-Fermi squared small, G-Fermi less small, square root of G-Fermi, okay? Still small, but less small of small, okay? So it, 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 it gave us um, 
it gave us um, uh, a boost to keep working on it. It also created the presence of the earth, not only creates an effect at this level, but it also creates a gradient. So all these no goals that were there and said, oh, you cannot measure it in a laboratory, I said, well, on the surface of the earth, without doing anything, you have a free gradient. So whatever was said back then does not apply. So everyone gave up too easily. So the reason why the, this is the rough picture, and I'll go into the details of why that happens. And please, I, I, I'm glad you asked the question. So if anyone has any sort of question during the talk, please interrupt me. I'd rather go like that than uh, go off to the side. Okay, great, thank you, yeah. So, I mean, so far you've talked about detecting like a static force. Yeah. Uh, if it, since it's a background, uh, there should be a force spectral density from the passing of the waves. Uh, but, oh, 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 good. So, so, oh, okay. No, it's not. And I'll come back to it. Okay. So, 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 yes, there is a force. So the, the distribution I'm treating, so this is a, what I'm be talking about is like a mean field approach. So I assume you integrate four times faster than the crossing time of a neutrino within a millimeter. Exactly, yeah. So that force, but that acceleration is is large, okay? But it varies at such short high frequencies and such short length scales that it makes it extreme. I think this is better. So we can I can tell you the size when I show this. So we have yeah we discussed it and we thought about it. The problem is it varies that if you convert the numbers at gigahertz frequencies and there's no coherence, it's a noise, okay? So, um, so I mean, we have it there. We estimated. We we think we'll come back to it when I talk about size and effects again. But uh, I mean, it's a good thought. I mean, but and, and now I'm treating the, the distribution of neutrinos as uniform. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yes. One more question. Yeah. There's no. I didn't understand this argument. So you said that if a single atom has a potential with a constant. Oh, good, good, good. So this is on the force of atoms. So good. So the wavelength of, of neutrinos is millimeter. So basically the neutrino, the, the, for the stuff that is relevant for us, for like matter, the distance between us atoms is an angstrom. So you can treat everything as uniform. So that, that small scale fluctuation doesn't matter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Some of them, that's the point, not all of them. Okay, and brings me to this slide. Okay, so, so now the sign of the interaction potential with the earth depends on the type of neutrino you have. So electron antineutrinos and muon and tau neutrinos get attracted from the earth. So if I were to draw their trajectories, their wavefront trajectories as rays, they would move away from the surface. So these guys are, these, the, for these guys, the earth is transparent to them, okay? And by transparent, I don't mean the absorption. I mean whether they will bounce back, okay? Because absorption, forget about it. Absorption effect is G Fermi squared, it's time. There's no absorption for these guys. So for these guys, they just get accelerated as they go through the earth, the lines move away from the surface. So uh, they speed up inside the earth. They don't get accelerated, they just speed up, okay? Now, if you go to electron neutrinos and muon and tau antineutrinos, the opposite happened. They are repelled from the earth. So if you draw their trajectories as rays, you will see that the ray cl gets closer and closer in the distance at some point where they come at very grazing incidence, um, they bounce back. So for these neutrinos, the Earth is not transparent. They just don't go through. They bounce back. So by the fact that they bounce back, they kind of like there's a sort of traffic jump close to the surface of the Earth, and that creates an excess of electron neutrinos versus electron antineutrinos close to the surface. And I'll explain to you how that happens. Okay, in more detail now. So, so if you think in terms of optics, this Interaction energy of the neutrinos with the Earth defines a refraction index. And the difference of the refraction index from one measures 
the change basically of the momentum of neutrinos as they go through the Earth. You have one medium, and because the interaction energy is different, the kinetic energy, if you look at energy eigenstate, the kinetic energy, the momentum changes. And it's basically measures U relative to the kinetic energy of the neutrino. And this is roughly for realistic materials between 10 to the minus 8, 10 minus 7 um, dimensionless number. So it's a small number. Just to give you an idea, for ordinary light, as people know, this is order 1. Okay. For X rays, though, this is 10 to the minus 6, the index of refraction. For gamma rays, it gets even smaller. So this is somewhere between X-rays and gamma rays in terms of magnitude of how different the index of refraction is from one. So, which is kind of good news. At least now we have a standard model example of an electromagnetic example where this is. Now the main difference, of course, is wavelength, right? X-rays have KV Armstrong wavelength and these have millimeter wavelength, which makes the story a bit. Now you, as I said, depends for neutrinos now, the interaction is that neutrinos is depends on the number density of matter, the ma atoms, times the charge of each atom, which is a function of the atomic number and the total number of neutrinos in the, in the atom. And it's different depending on the type of neutrino you have. Uh, the interaction is repulsive for electron neutrinos and muon and tau antineutrinos. And I was just, for the sake of argument, I was just, the things that I repent, I'll just call neutrinos. I'll stick with electron neutrinos from now on, just not to say everything uh, uh, everywhere. And in terms of absolute size, the interaction is between 10 minus 15 EV, 10 minus 15 EV versus the kinetic energy which is 10 to the minus 6 EV. So this matches that in some ways for when the neutrino mass is 0.1 EV, which is, this is uh, close to where the astrophysical part is. So, so what happens to a neutrino wave as it goes through the Earth, as it hits the Earth's surface? And for that, let's simplify, let's assume the Earth is one-dimensional, okay? So here you have the energy of the neutrino. This is the, um, the potential um, uh, interaction energy. We'll care about the ones that are repelled. So this that goes up inside the Earth. Now, most of the neutrinos come with very high energy. So I mean, if you were to do this, is this is basically in 1D quantum mechanics and the graduate quantum mechanics problem, right? You have part of the wave that gets reflected, part of the wave that gets transmitted. But because the U is so small, for most of these, this is a tiny effect. So most of the things don't even feel this uh, small potential. But now, let's make the interaction energy smaller. So let's imagine that you have some kinetic energy <laughs> that supported this interaction potential. Then the wave cannot classically penetrate that region. So the whole wave bounces back. There is no, the whole wave gets reflected. Okay. And you're left with a little, um, there is the wave function. Uh, you find some wave function of the wave in a, which is known in a reflection as a vanessent wave from electromagnetism. Um, and this happens because of quantum mechanics or because of wave dynamics and the wave gets reflected back. Okay, in 1D, this happens only for neutrinos whose kinetic energy is comparable to the size of the step. Okay, but luckily for us, we are not in one dimension. And so now, because of the symmetry of the problem, so if I look at the waves that come now at an angle, the momentum that's parallel to the surface does not change. All that matters is the momentum that's perpendicular to the surface. So, what I require now for total reflection is that the kinetic energy, the component of the kinetic energy perpendicular to the surface is less than the interaction potential. So that gives me that there is a critical momentum for reflection, which goes like the square root of the interaction potential. So the square root of the G -firm, of Fermi's constant. And the interesting thing, if you plug in numbers, this is roughly three meters, okay? This also sets the scale of the evanescent wave. So this means two cool things. First of all, this is not cosmological scales. This is laboratory scales, right? This room is bigger than three meters. Um, and this happens because of the value of U and also because of the mass of the neutrino. And, um, uh, and exactly because 
there's going to be two species of neutrinos. The ones that are repelled now are forced to bounce back, effectively slowing down on the surface of the Earth, and spend more time near the bubble. Now the question is what fraction of the neutrinos, or what fraction of the neutrinos does that happen? And basically, this set by the critical angle for reflection, so it's the ratio of the critical momentum perpendicular to the surface for reflection over the overall momentum. If you run this number, this is roughly 10 to the minus four, which is a significant fraction of the neutrinos. So you have an excess of neutrinos versus antineutrinos of 10 to the minus four. So in vacuum, it's 10 to the minus nine. So you have enhanced locally the asymmetry by five orders of magnitude. And at the same time, you've generated a gradient because of the evanescent wave. The wave nature of the neutrinos allows you to create a region of about three meters on the surface of the Earth, where you have this asymmetry persisting. Uh, three meters to the Earth? Yes, and up, up from the Earth. Well, also up. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so the up is not so, so, so that's a good question. So the inside the Earth is because of the evanescent wave, so it's because what enters the exponent. The outside the Earth, it's actually a bit non-trivial. So it happens, so when a get, wave gets reflected, you create some sort of standing wave with the, with the, with the incoming wave. Um, and naively, you would expect to see some oscillation. Uh, but turns out, okay, there is the, oh, uh, there is a phase shift that, that happens every time a wave gets reflected, there's an additional phase, and I forget the name is. Uh, uh, oh, God, it's now I'm having a brain uh, block, but that's fine. Maybe I'll remember it later. That shifts the, for each, for given, for different incident samples, this phase is different. So the standard wave, minimum and maximum, don't always align. And you also have to average over the momentum of the neutrinos because the neutrinos have a thermal distribution. Okay, so when you do that, you end up uh, with something that looks fairly symmetric inside and outside, but that's only an accident because the index of refraction of the neutrinos are small. If I were to have do the same problem with an index of refraction that's closer to one, I would find a significant asymmetry between the distribution of inside and outside. But to, for the order that we care about, um, if you take the interference effects and how they conspire and the phase conspires to give you roughly the same gradient inside and outside the Earth. Okay, yes? What about waves that are considered from inside the Earth? Good. So, okay, good. That's the great part. So these guys are, are the ones that had to go through the Earth, yeah. so they sped up. So if you think about in the simple geometric optics pictures, they can never come at angles smaller than grazing incidence just by definition. So you don't have to worry about things that, that come from the inside, basically because they have to be accelerated to go in the earth. So you say they, you get total internal reflection? No, 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 you don't. That's precisely the point. You never have, so if you, if you were to write, so if I were to have this surface here, yeah. the way that enters from, so let's say I want to have something to be reflected from the backside, right? Uh -huh. So from the first sphere, this guy had to come in. So the neutrinos are generated at vacuum at infinity. Yes. So they first have to go through the earth and the, sh the thing that would get reflected from the inside are the ones that get sped up on the earth to cancel the asymmetry, right? So this thing goes this way. So when you count, when you estimate what this angle is, when you calculate what this angle can never be smaller than critical. So they can never get reflected. Okay, so that's a crucial point. And could be other geometries. Uh, that's why actually, in fact, internal terrain can matter. So one of the things that's important, and uh, uh, I, I, I mean, for, for the purposes of this talk, this is fine print. In order to get perfect reflection, for example, people that, that design mirrors for telescopes and all this, you need um, the, uh, the, the asymmetries, the irregularities of the surface, to be less than the um, evanescent wavelength. Okay. So the moment that happens, you can get perfect reflection. So you don't. Uh, so you need a space place on the Earth that's flat enough. And there are spots like that on the Earth. There's the salt flats of Utah. There's the surface of water. 
uh, there's this cool salt class in Bolivia where actually the, the, the earth is, is flatter than a meter for 100 by 100 kilometers and they use it for satellite calibration, which is really cool apparently, yeah. So uh, there are spots of the earth where this can happen, but as you said, we need the terrain matter. So if you want to calculate the local distribution, I wish I didn't have the, the mathematical capabilities to do the problem of, of the full problem. So, so we start with the, we assume the earth is flat basically, <laughs> and found good reasons to believe that the effect won't go away uh, when you include curvature effects, okay? Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no one ever asks about that for some reason during talks. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this is what the distribution looks like. The size of the neutrino versus anti-neutrino asymmetry that you find is a function from the distance from the Earth. This is inside the Earth. This is outside the Earth. And it's fairly symmetric, as I said. Um, and then for different masses. So 0.8 EV is actually I think really unrealistic, is what comes out of uh, a laboratory experiments as a bound for the neutrino mass. And I don't think the cosmologists that have excluded <laughs> those masses don't know at all what they're talking about because neutrinos of, that master, of those masses would cluster way too much. So I think this is way optimistic that 0.8 EV is allowed. Uh, 0.15 EV is more realistic and 0.05 is actually the, the, the lowest bound for the heaviest neutrino mass you can have, okay? So um, what this tells you is, and the takeaway message is that if I take a sliver of a uh, flat, uh, uh, flat uh, part of the Earth's crust, uh, you will see a band of neutrino asymmetry where the local neutrino asymmetry is enhanced by five orders of magnitude compared to, um, to what you expect in, in the average cosmic density. And you also locally create a large gradient, laboratory gradient of three meters, yes? Is, is it important for you what the neutrino hierarchy is? Because you say ah, no, no, hierarchy? yeah. So that's a good question. So for these effects, the neutrino hierarchy, um, so for the numbers that I showed you, I only assume one neutrino species, and I took the heaviest mass. So the, the for the numbers I showed, if I used inverted hierarchy, it would give me a factor of two in what I have there on top of what I have. So in what I took, and, and I also assume flavor, I ignored mass mixings, um, flavor mixings, which will also modify border one. Not, not a lot, actually. It's a few, a few to 30% to corrections in the number that I gave. But I only took one species in contact. So it doesn't affect it. In fact, I, I, I'm hurting a bit by a factor of two, perhaps. If I were to do an inverted hierarchy, those numbers would be bigger. Because the electron would be the heaviest. No, no, it's just that the, the, no, no, because you have two, if you have inverted hierarchy, you have two closely generated states. So if you have the two heaviest guys are gonna be of similar mass, okay? That's the reason, okay? Um, so now I can imagine that I put, let's say the first thing you can do, okay, let's put a bunch of atoms, a test mass in the regions close to the surface of the earth and try to measure force. So how big is that force? Turns out that force is still really small, <laughs> okay? And it's about, just to give you an idea, it's about um, a, a million times smaller. Uh, yeah, 10 minus 31. Uh, maybe five, 10 to five times smaller than the, ma than the mass of a carbon atom, okay, than the weight of a carbon atom. So it's small, okay? Now the question that we ask ourselves is, can we do better than this? And, um, and by asking the question, I and mean, we went several iterations, and uh, so this is what we came up with. So if you take a bunch of logic material of length L oriented along the surface of a sphere of a similar radius and with W, uh, you will get a region in the center when their symmetry is enhanced. And this is because this acts like a diffraction phase grade for neutrinos, okay? And this also takes advantage of the power, basically the wave nature of neutrinos. Otherwise, if the wavelength of the neutrinos was not so large, this wouldn't have been possible. 
So how does it work? So if you take the set, let's imagine you have material and I can tell you later what other material can be. So you have length L with W. You have, uh, let's take a neutrino wave falling paraxially, as they say in optics on this rod. And to a good approximation, when you see what comes out at the end of the rod after the wave propagated inside the rod, you see that outside in the region, uh, except for a small cross section in the face of the rod, you find that you have the same plane wave you had before. But in front of the rod, the face has acquired an additional phase shift, which is proportional to the length of the rod. The difference of the index of refraction of the rod with respect to one, basically how what is the interaction potential of neutrinos inside the rod and the wave and the wave number of neutrinos. Okay. So K delta L. So now the question is: if we go a certain distance away, what do we see at a certain point D? How do we do that? And in fact, we know how to do that for uh, centuries now. It's called uh, a Kirchhoff's integral theorem. Uh, and uh, so we know there is Kirchhoff's integral theorem tells you if I know the, if I have something that satisfies the wave equation and I know its value on a surface of a closed, uh, on a closed surface, I can calculate the field anywhere inside that surface. And, um, and the reason is, actually, in reality, we know how to do this even before the 19th century because of Hoyens. Hoyens in the 17th century said, well, the reason this happens is you can treat each point of the surface as sources of, of spherical waves, and you can calculate the interference patterns at D based on the local intensity, and that will give you the wave. And the cool thing about Hoyens, he did it 200 years, before Kirchhoff, and he did it without any math. Okay, he saw that he was doing wave. The people would do like wave experiments. He would do how they would place an object in the surface of a lake, and to see that waves would go around corners. So just from these basic observations, Hoyle said, "This is how waves should propagate," and turns out he was right. So, uh, which I think is pretty amazing tells you how much how what great physicist he was and tells you like how much we underestimate how much people knew so in reality what i'm doing now is 17th century physics so secretly i don't know i'm talking about neutrinos uh but it's really i mean it's it's truly remarkable to think about that without use of any mathematics just by his physical intuition he derived something that he could prove 200 years later Okay, so now we take this again, we have our rod, now we are in a position to calculate what a signal. So we treat, this is the wavefront that we get at the end of the rod. So we treat each point as a source of a spherical wave and we calculate the, um, the pattern at the distance away. And what we find is the interference pattern from these spherical waves that are emitted. We find something like this. Actually, if you look at this, this is very similar to what you know from optics. If you take a hole and you shine light on it, the laser, this is a, a diffraction pattern, okay? So, and this happens now because the, the wave interferes with itself. So the waves, the partial waves from the plane wave part interferes with the part that has acquired a phase and that part that has acquired a phase plays the role of the opening. So this is where the name diffraction phase rate comes from. So you have this interference effect. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember from your optics book, you, know, you calculate when the partial waves from the front of the rod of the opening would interfere constructively for the first time. And you find that that happens at the distance. That's, um, that's the width squared divided by the wavelength. <laughs> now you see why the wavelength is so important. So for a fixed width, if I take the wavelength to zero, this distance goes to infinity. So it's very important that the neutrinos have millimeter-sized wavelength for this to work. 
The other interesting thing is that the width of this pattern is uh, um, is set by the by the opening of the rod. So now, before I was telling you about the evanescent wave of three meters, now it works out for if you want to build something that's between a few meters to 100 meters, this, uh, this uh, width that sets the gradient of the asymmetry that I created is a border, um, uh, it's a border 10 to 50 centimeters, so much smaller. So I've enhanced the force in another way. Now, the size of this peak here is set by the size of the face. And for what I'm doing here, I can never get something that's bigger than uh, than order one. Okay. In order to get something that's bigger than order one, you need the neutrinos to travel a very large, very kilometers, kilometers of material. So this will be uh, always less than one. So now this is how the diffraction pattern looks in a more fancy way. Um, so the distance. So this is where you see that this happens. The the excess happens. And this is where you see a, a vertical cross section. So you always get an excess of the species that has index of refraction larger than one inside the material. So for the Earth, you get an excess of neutrinos. That means for these guys, the way it's designed, you get an excess of anti neutrinos. Now, things you have to do. First of all, the neutrinos are not monochromatic. Okay? So you need to average over the wavelength of neutrinos because they have a thermal distribution. So when you do that, you lose the funny interference patterns on the side, but the central region still remains. So you get a much more uniform pattern. Um, there is another very important thing is that the neutrinos are also very different from sunlight. Sunlight is thermal, it will still focus it and do things with it because it's unidirectional. Neutrinos come from everywhere. So this is where the synergy comes in. You need to do to to, to manage to manipulate neutrinos coming from all directions. Okay? So that's why, because you need to form high coverage, you need to place this rod on the surface. Now there is, um, I can actually skip this point here, but in reality, you need to worry about neutrinos coming in between the sticks. And that you need to be careful how you do the average. Turns out that we think this doesn't, this doesn't destroy the effect. Uh, it changes the distribution. Um, and uh, the bottom line gathers gives you like this, if you think about that makes sense, because all that matters is the optical path that the neutrinos travel inside material. So when you think about it, if you have something that comes in between, it gives you some pattern like this. So the axis appears a bit of center. Okay. Um, so now we put it all together. So we need to take rods of length L, if uh, the, the width can be chosen, so if I make the radius of the sphere where the, where the rods are placed, um, uh, uh, I pick W so that W squared over lambda is of order the length, the rods, so that I get the maximum of the effect. Now the question is what material do I use? So this is a summary of different indices of refraction for different materials. Uh, look at these guys here. What you need is large Z, large atomic numbers, large density. Um, very nice stuff, depleted uranium. Okay, very nice stuff. People don't know how, what to do with it. They use it for the wrong reasons. It's not so radioactive. So keep people, it's a great use for this type of stuff. Uh, and, and the US turns out has a big stock pile of it. We got this idea actually from um, Giorgio Grata and neutrino experimenters who told us, what did you do? Well, we're using tungsten and iron and all stuff like that. But he told us, well, there may be stuff that's a slightly radioactive that people don't want to use. So you can use the other people's junk, basically. Uh, so, so, um, so actually, we use depleted uranium as one of our um, possible candidates. Materials, tungsten, of course, is very nice. And if you want to really go high in size, iron is the most abundant element, heavy element uh, on Earth. So you can make iron. So we, we use different parameters. So we decide we have different widths, lengths of the rods, radii, 
And uh, there is a little gap that you need between the rods so that it doesn't eventually appear uniform to the waves. Um, and this is the shape that you get. So if you were to look at the center of that, around the center of that uh, sea urchin, you will see an axis of antineutrinos versus neutrinos. And this is the radial cross-section of it. Uh, so for two meter uranium, 10 meter tungsten, 100 meter iron, iron. So you see already with two meters uranium, depleted uranium, okay, specify. So you already get a factor of 10 larger asymmetry that you get from the Earth. And the gradient is already much larger. So already with the man-made structure of a few meters, you gain what the Earth does for free, over the Earth does for free, which is great. And then the question is how big do you want to make it? And then it becomes uh, another. Now we go back to detection. And this is the part that's going to be the least, uh, the most iffy of my dog, let's say. And the reason is, as, as I said, when we started thinking about it, we didn't dive directly into detection because every time we did, we found a tiny signal. So we decided, okay, what is the signal? How big can we make the signal? And then we can decide how to detect. So this is something that we just, we have started thinking about. And uh, what are possible detection schemes? So the thing roughly, and this one will give you some rough idea of the thing we have in mind. So, so this is the surgeon, this is the antineutrino which is close to the center. So you place a detector close to where the gradient is large so that it maximizes the force. You place a test mass there. Now the test mass again needs to be from heavy dense material, so it has a large weak charge, so it maximizes that force. And you try to measure that force. That's the bottom line. Okay. We have experiments like that. So if you take two different materials and connect them with a rod, that's basically a torsion balance. So this is what people use to test the equivalence principle. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that. So we are now trying to decide exactly how what the, that this is and what type of geometry. Um, but let's see what the force is first. So the force, this is how the force field looks like. This is the side of the force. So the bottom line is 10 minus 28 newton. Still very small, uh, but it's still much larger compared to what you would get from coherent scattering, for example, of neutrinos, or what you would get from the Earth. And the interesting thing about it is if you were to plot this force as a function of the mass of the neutrinos, you see that if I were to take the, what the theorists would do, take the standard quantum limit of a mass of 20 kilograms, that's at these frequencies and with this Q factor, it doesn't have to be at these frequencies, it doesn't have to be with this Q factor, okay? Now we are close to that. So now we took something that was that was impossible to measure. Now we have a signal that at least it's in principle measurable because it's above the standard quantum limit. Okay. This is a this this doesn't qualify though as a proposal. Okay, because I haven't told you, well, what on earth, as we were discussing before, what, what on earth are you gonna measure? I mean, this 0.1 millihertz is basically a DC measurement. You have all sorts of problems at those frequencies. So the thing to do is actually, and this is where human manipulation comes in, we can actually move the search. And the question is how fast can you move it? So, and this is, and this is comes into what we started thinking about. So the search, you know that the search is periodic. So it's a start segmenting and so changing it from uniform to something non-uniform and putting it back together. The, the period, if I have a mechanism that, pe that puts it at a period omega, if I have n segments within the circle, the period of change, the, the frequency of change, sorry, of the signal is n times omega. And then even for a two meter thing, it's like close to a thousand. So even if I have something that moves at a millihertz, I can get a hertz, a, a 10 hertz change in frequency. Okay. So, so this is, so it looks like, there could be ways that you could imprint a reasonable frequency and 10 hertz for people, I guess, if there are in the light of people in the audience, 10 hertz is a good frequency for gravity gradient noise. 
it's a good frequency for seismic noise. Um, it's a better frequency than other stuff. Not it's better than a millihertz for sure. So yeah, right. Why do you want to move the sea urchin? Why can't you just move the location of the experiment? No, no, no. That's that you don't move the experiment. You can avoid moving something. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we thought about it. It just in the, use another kind of worms. It's just a sea urchin, at least in small size. You can talk about the hundred we testing how to move that. That's another yeah, that's issue. Fine. Yeah, but you don't have to go. Actually, we think you may be able to do a lot of stuff because the force actually, because of the way the, the gradient scales with the size, with the length. Um, if you do the math, turns out you don't really, you gain some if you go to 100 meters, but if you build something of depleted uranium with 10 meters, you've already gained most of it that you would get. So, so it doesn't have to mean that you move the 100 meter thing. Okay. So if you can avoid moving the thing, no, no. I, I, if you try to measure something that's less than the weight of a carbon atom, I wouldn't move it. <laughs> uh, that's 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 my thinking, but I'm also theory. You, you just think it will cause more noise. Oh yeah. The, yeah, and also you introduce the noise exactly at the frequency that you want. So yeah. so a lot of the vibration, like if you have a, a motor that works at I don't know at at the millihertz. And the change of your signals at that hertz, you already isolate a lot of the sources of the noise. So it gives you an additional handle, the fact that you have n segments to determine the periodicity and change the frequency of your signal. I mean, that also has its other problems, but so I, I, I would do that. But hey, maybe someone will come up with a better idea. So, so this is the direction that we're at now. And in fact, I don't have time to go through enough. I'll, I'll stop here. Of course, the obvious thing for a particle physics to think about, I, as I said, I stuck to the standard model physics, but what about dark matter? <laughs> can you do anything with dark matter? Turns out you can. You can do it for my, my thing, which is axions, because those also have microscopic, uh, microscopic wavelengths, and turns out the force is actually larger <laughs> than it is from the neutrinos for axions, because they, and mainly because axions are more Dark matter is, has higher number density than neutrinos. That's the problem uh, for neutrinos. So anyway, so I will skip the axial part, but it's a well-motivated thing that you can look for. It's still though hypothetical. Neutrinos are there. So even though these guys give you, in principle, bigger force, a thousand times bigger, they're still hypothetical. So, so to conclude here, uh, we have found that uh, the presence of the Earth alone is significant is enough to change appreciably the local distribution of the cosmic neutrino background, and uh, and and basically on the based on refractive effects, using the same effects, we think we can design uh, structures that can be used to manipulate the CUB and, and of course that matter um, in a laboratory scale, opening a new avenue. In fact, principal challenges. For uh, for these uh, for these uh, for these things. Now, um, coming back to your question about the stochastic force. So the stochastic force is similar in size. So it's roughly about ten minus twenty nine newton or so, ten minus twenty eight newton. Uh, the problem is, as I said, is the frequency and the fact that it's really a noise force. So we uh, we we. We don't know of how how to design. I think it's worth thinking about. I just don't know what can operate at such high frequencies uh, to measure it. Uh, unfortunately, I mean it's there. Um, so now let's talk about the challenges. Okay, as I said, we don't have the full detection scheme yet, so we are thinking about it and enumerating all the things that need to be backgrounds because it's not enough. As experimental is not very well. It's not the authority, so theoretical calculation of the standard quantum limit to say that I have proposed an experiment. Okay, so we need to go through the systematics <coughs> and, and backgrounds for this type of setup. But and, and the experiments are far away from there. Okay, we're we're not near. But we found ourselves. This is not a, 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 this is not something that hasn't happened in the past. So if you look at the atomic clock accuracy, for example. So you see over the last 
70 years, we gain roughly 10 orders of magnitude. And we're still on exponential, right? Similar thing for EDM measurements. Um, and uh, even with cross-sections have improved with the decades. So what we are thinking about will not happen tomorrow. We know that. Um, but um, it's such a challenge that's a worthwhile challenge. Um, in fact, when I was preparing the talk, I was trying to find a similar plot that shows the evolution of gravitational wave detectors with time. Because the discovery of the cosmic neutrino background is more akin to the discovery of gravitational waves. We know they're there. We know that they are a cosmological tool that will give us a window of the universe when it was a fraction of a second ball. So, so that sets a different standard of how much effort as a community we should be putting into it. And, um, and, and it makes the stakes higher, okay? So ultimately, what I'm excited about is uh, we may be given the opportunity, I don't know when, we may be given the opportunity to take a snapshot of the universe when it was just a baby. So the question is how what that would like. So with this, I leave you and thank you very much. Ends up, I gotta run, otherwise, I'm gonna be bad and wrap up. Uh, <laughs> John will take care of the questions. Great yeah. talk, thank yeah. you. I'll see you thank tomorrow. You. Yeah, bye. Mark was so excited by Mir's talk that he's But he, uh, I'll take the, uh, he gave me permission to ask the first question. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So, as you explain, the origin of the cosmic neutrino background mm -hmm. is pretty well understood in nuclear physics that determines when the neutrinos decouple. Yeah. Um, so what are the cosmologically informative <laughs> signatures we should look for in that background? Good, that's a very interesting question. So first of all, just to be precise, so the neutrinos decoupled a little bit before mm -hmm. the, the BBN happened. Mm -hmm. So they happen at three to five MeV. So in principle, if you were to detect them, you would detect the relic that gives you information, maybe just a fraction, but right before the BN, okay? And it's an interesting thing to see what would happen. So, so in terms of- audience, that means big bang. Big C, yeah, yeah, big bang nuclear synthesis where you get the nuclei. So the cosmological observables is, for example, what is the neutrino asymmetry that's left over? And I know we manipulate it, but there could be ways to reverse engineer the, the primordial thing. Um, uh, there's another sector. So they've spent a lot of time traveling the universe without doing interacting with anything, right? So that, I don't know what it would be good for. It could be that it's good for nothing. It could be that it's good for nothing and it's there. But every time, it has happened that every time we discover something new, we have a new ways to look at the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So given how little is known in terms of the parameters of the neutrino sector, for example, you'll be able to measure, actually a very interesting thing is the question of Dirac versus Majoran. Mm -hmm. So what I described here is for purely Dirac neutrinos, okay? And uh, for Majoran and neutrinos, turns out these interactions are velocity suppressed. So Majoran is another type of neutrino where, depending on how neutrinos get their mass, where the neutrinos are their own antiparticle. And, uh, and in fact, this is something that I have not appreciated. So we have experiments that are claimed to determine whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana, neutrinos double beta decay experiments. But there is you can write higher dimension operators that do not give neutrinos mass that actually give a signal to the neutrinos double beta decay, but the neutrinos are still Dirac because these are higher dimension operators. So in a way, these guys here are actually, this type of signatures will be very well accustomed to say Dirac versus Majorac inclusive. That's one thing. Uh, yes? There's a, you'll generate a Majorac mass at this level if you have neutrinos double beta decay. There's a black box here. You'll, you'll violate left on number and you'll always have a higher on the Yeah, there could be there are, there are ways. So there's a paper by by um, 
uh, actually, Savas only has a model of left flight symmetric theories where that happens, mm -hmm. so where you can complete the, the neutrino mass. And also, there's a paper by Gia. I haven't thought about it myself. Um, but uh, yeah, according to, to Gia and Savas, it looks like you can do it. It could be that, yeah, so that's the other thing. Um, yeah, other questions? Yeah? It seems that uh, you're proposing to measure the Casimir effect on the neutrinos so by the temperature. No, it's not Casimir effect. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the gradient of a conservative potential. It's like the analog of a short range gravitational force. It's not much thicker than that. It's not a Casimir force. It is not micro fluctuations involved. It's just you have an interaction potential. And I measure the gradient of that, that interaction potential that produces a force. Yeah, but it, you can also simplify this problem as uh, an equilibrium, thermal equilibrium problem. Uh, there are neutrinos of thermal equilibrium, and there is some uh, configuration of uh, the electric materials of this structure, which uh, has some reflection index for neutrinos. Mm -hmm. You're measuring the potential. That was that, yeah. So, so if you measure a force that that so that setup that you are describing, you can understand correctly, and we can discuss it more later. That force would be zero because the density is uniform in what you are describing. The density of so the force between ah, that's another. Let's talk about it. I know what you're talking about. It will take us in a tangent. No, that's not what I'm measuring. I can tell you later what we're proposing. Okay. There's another force. There's another force that comes, and it's not what I'm talking about. But I, I can we talk about it? Because yeah, explaining right. to yeah. you will take will take us like in another tangent. Okay? Okay. okay. So, but that's not what we're proposing here. Here you have a macroscopic region where you create a potential. Forget about where it's coming from. I create a potential where matter can interact, and that potential has a gradient. Okay. Yes. So I can, um, uh, so I can, uh, 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 so that force I can detect. So it, that's another thing that you're talking about. I can discuss it later. Okay, it's much smaller what you're talking about than what I'm talking about. It's much smaller force. Ah, uh, Kim, yeah, you're showing the map of the CMD and SR. So with what you were proposing, I'm assuming you're you're trying to detect something, some event, but then yeah. you thought about. And I thought because you're getting a local. Yeah, standard. no, we have not thought so. We're taking everything to be uniform. We haven't thought about relative motion. We haven't thought about what happens if you have how the, the change in this shape, how that transforms. <laughs> because it's a hard problem, and I couldn't do it. Sorry, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I, it's in a higher level question that I, I, I thought I could put off to. To, to, to but maybe in a hundred years we'll be detecting the neutrino. Maybe in a hundred years. Maybe in a hundred years. Uh, maybe I won't be around for it. Yeah. Maybe. But they're there. Uh, yes. So you put everything in units of force for the final gradient to be detected. But at the center where the anisotropy is the highest. Can you also put it as like what's the fractional change in something's mass? Ah, yes, good. Yes, you could. You could. Good. Yes, that's another way to think about it. So that's a, a ten to the minus thirty four EV shift on an hour. EV shift. So ten to minus thirty four EV shift, which is Hubble scale. So that's just to give you an idea. If you work to measure it as a mass shift. Yeah, and we did think about some other interferometer stuff. No. It's even worse than this. It's surprising that the force seems more detectable than that. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, because the problem with statistics actually the force gains. So in reality, you always measure some sort of acceleration, right? So the acceleration in principle from a big object or an atom does not matter. What matters is the noise. And, and, and when you measure the acceleration, the noise gets the fundamental noise, the thermal noise. Forget about systematics for a second. Throw that out of the way. So the, the noise gets better. The fundamental things go less when they are heavier. When the center of mass has more atoms. That's, that, that's basically why Avogadro's number helps. Uh, observing more stuff helps. 
So for, for atomic interferometry, we couldn't find anything that would be anywhere near some of the right, but I think it's <coughs> just as reasonable to, to measure such small energy shifts. I mean, we're still thinking about other stuff that could be used to measure, but nothing that, yeah. But excellent. Yeah. Nice question. Uh, thank you for a really nice talk. Um, I guess uh, I was wondering how um, in your talk you're kind of mapping this really complicated problem of neutrino interactions mm -hmm. with Earth into almost a very rudimentary plane of optics situation. Um, and so is, is this kind of procedure always possible? I'd imagine but like this is very different from standard interpretive calculations. Like, Say that again, sorry. Um, yeah. Just like the, the, the way kind of you describe the neutrino interaction with yeah. the surface. Yeah. And the, optics problem yeah um is is this description always possible like, yeah why not <laughs> if they obey the schrodinger equation why do you think it's not possible why would it not be possible but just because it's very simple doesn't make it not true right because i'm talking about particle physics and it's i mean having said that it takes a while to get to this nice picture oh it's potential well and oh it's nice undergraduate level problem. No, we went through several. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny that it turns out to be. Um, and, and as someone pointed out, I think that person just said, they, the fact is that you see uniform. The wavelength is macroscopic. You see things very uniform. So a mean field approach is good enough. So there's no like simplification or assumptions. There are simplification in terms of the curvature of the terrain that I haven't taken into account, but that's not because it, optics does not apply. It just makes the problem hard to track. Um, yeah, but it, I, no, they're non relativistic. See, this is the thing. Just because they're fancy neutrinos, they're wave properties, right? Quantum mechanics works for the stuff that people do in the lab. It works for the things that have everything is quantum mechanics, everything is quantum field theory. So you cannot separate what you choose to pick. Everything has to apply everywhere. Well, well, this is a fascinating topic for physicists who delight in detecting very weak forces. And this is just like very loud particles that really exist. <laughs> 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 <laughs>